Okay, cool. I'm going to. <laughs> okay, guys, I think we'll get going. Oh, no, I was just going to wait for Sean. No, it's okay. I'm going to move over here since. <laughs> Sorry. You guys don't have the agenda. And so I can have all the time off, but I want to. You guys don't have the agenda. Agenda's right there. But Okay. And folks online can hear us okay when we're talking? Yep. Okay, perfect. Great. All right, cool. So um, while we wait for people to get uh, settled up here, I'll just talk a little bit about some logistics. Uh, I think I told everybody, but just in case um, there's any confusion. So this is our uh, Cal State Channel Islands Boating Center. Um, and so we have the full reign of the upstairs for the next couple of days. So um, this is our space. And uh, bathrooms are just to the right behind me over here. There's a cool patio deck. So if you guys need to catch a call or something, you're more than welcome to step out there. Um, the harbor, all that good stuff, um, and uh, we have a little kitchen behind us. So if we if we need some more plates or something else, uh, you know, we can we can just grab stuff out of there. Um, uh, we have sandwiches coming uh, at eleven thirty, um, and just sort of a random mix of stuff. I, I hope uh, nobody's hardcore vegan or something. I, I tried to cover the bases, but they they changed the sandwich options on me uh, yesterday evening. But um, but anyway, do we have sandwich coming? Um, and uh, uh, well, that's that's it. So um, by way of uh, also introduction, if you guys parked out there, we're all good. There's no, nobody needs to pay for anything. There's no there's no uh, meters or anything of that nature. Um, we're gonna go. Um, uh, we'll talk about what we're doing today, but we're gonna um, start with some introductions uh, just to us as as people to begin with, and then to our project and all that kind of good stuff. Um, we have several folks that. Uh, COVID and other things sort of came up that, that um, couldn't uh, be with us here, which is kind of cool. So we're actually recording this uh, session because we're streaming it and, and this will also allow us for folks that, that, that aren't on here to sort of watch that and get caught up. Um, but that's, that'll just go for the morning. So we will do introductions, we'll do introductions to the, the uh, project and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and uh, some of our folks online can stay for the whole morning, some can just stay for a little bit. So once we get their introductions and all that good stuff, um, they will pop off. And then we'll get into the more um, significant brainstorming and sort of idea generation sort of late morning into, into lunchtime. And, um, and we'll, we'll go today till about uh, five-ish, and then we'll retreat uh, about a block that way to a wine bar and uh, continue discussions and have uh, fun discussions. And there's a bunch of places for, um, for dinner around us. Uh, so. So that's the logistics for today. Is there, are there anything, any other um, sort of high level stuff people are wondering about that I didn't touch on or, or anybody online? So guys online, you, you guys can chime in. I think we can hear you fine if, you, if there's anything that didn't make sense. Hey, Sean, this is Pete. I, it was a little hard to hear you for a little while. Oh, okay. Uh, now is it, is it okay, Pete? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll just uh, remember to stand next to the owl, the giant owl. And, and uh, so if you guys haven't used one of these, um, when we talk, this automatically, it's an omnidirectional um, uh, camera, so it'll, somebody sitting over there, it'll stream their face, that, that kind of thing. Um, but if, that, if that's the case, Pete, if it's a little hard to hear, maybe when we do our introductions, maybe if you guys could step up, except for um, this broken joint, uh, people can maybe step up here and, uh, <laughs> and uh, just do their, their intro so it's clear. Although it might be better back here, I don't know. Okay. Right, I mean, because you're kind of behind now. Uh, Pete, can you hear Rich talking okay? No, I couldn't, but but ask someone else because maybe it's on my end just to be. Yeah. I could hear Rich okay. okay. It's it's faint, but I could hear him. If I listen closely, I can hear. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of way it was with me too. If I listen yeah. really intently. Yeah, we, we will attempt to uh, enunciate clearly and, and, and well. Um, awesome, okay, great. Well, uh, thanks everybody. So why don't we get uh, get going then? Um, and since I'm not staring at the screen again, you folks online, if something is amiss, just please unmute and just uh, and just speak up and tell us that uh, you couldn't hear something or whatever. Um, 
wanted to just start with just basic introductions, so folks could just give us a, a who you are, your name, and 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 day job, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we we don't have you know hours and hours for this, so maybe you know three to five minutes, just a, a brief um, overview of you, and maybe how you relate to restoration mitigation types of types of issues. And then um, if you run out of stuff to say, we'd love to hear uh, two examples of challenges that you might have either personally experienced or are worried about in the context of out of kind mitigation and those types of and those types of things. So um, so with that, maybe I'll get going and then maybe we could um, uh, uh, do the room and then after the room, maybe we can do the folks online, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, so welcome everybody. Thanks for thanks for showing up. Um, I'm uh, Sean Anderson. I am a uh, professor at Cal State Channel Islands, and I know just about all of you because I've you've been my professors or partners or collaborators or friends or whatever for, for some time. Um, and uh, so I'm in a super long name department called Environmental Science and Resource Management. We're an interdisciplinary program, and that reflects a lot of my um, research. Um, so with regards to restoration, I, I first started really doing restoration with um, two of the people in the back, with Spencer and with uh, Rich, uh, in graduate school at UCLA, where we started working on salt marsh restoration out at, uh, at Magoo Lagoon, um, naval base here in Ventura County. And I've continued to do restoration projects uh, ever since, so for about 30 years, uh, all across the coastal zone and some stuff farther inland, but most of my experience is in the coastal zone. Um, and my largest project, my largest current project is one actually not in California, it's in uh, coastal Louisiana doing bottom and hardwood forest restoration um, over about a thousand acres now. Um, uh, began post Katrina and has continued on. Um, I also serve on a bunch of um, uh, science advisory panels and elected positions, um, Santa Monica Mountains, etc. And um, uh, particularly interested in connectivity in terms of restorations. And so I, I've I've done um, a good amount of stuff related to our uh, wildlife crossing of the 101, for example, in uh, Madura Hills or Liberty Canyon area. Um, so, so that's me. Uh, I would say, let's see, things I'm worried about with out of kind uh, mitigation. Um, I think there's huge potential, but I'm also very worried about the pitfalls. I'm, I'm worried as we go more towards out of kind, which we will, I think, need to go in the future, that it, um, I'm worried it might give some people a pass to do things um, maybe not to the same rigor or not to the same um, uh, quality. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I guess, I guess that's, my, uh, that's my, my big worry about this stuff. Uh, I'm also worried about funding. I'm also worried about how funding is gonna track when we hit the um, out of time. So that is me. Who would like to go next? Rich, you wanna go next? Sure. You said you'd be in the cult though, Rich, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's me. That's the point. He's a rocking in my closet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Rich Ambrose, I'm a semi-retired professor from UCLA, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so I've been involved in mitigation probably for about 40 years or so, um, mostly coastal, um, mostly aquatic habitats, uh, done a lot of wetland restoration and some other things, I've had a bunch of students who have worked on restoration projects, and especially my students in the core who have helped me learn a lot more about the regulatory aspects of that. Um, let's see, I think, so uh, one of my first experiences with mitigation was for the Coastal Commission, working on the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. Um, I was the contractor responsible for evaluating mitigation alternatives and making recommendations to the commission about um, what appropriate mitigation would be for that project, and um, then working with the commission staff to write the permit conditions for that project. And then that project, I never thought that I would work on that project for my entire career. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, so it's taught me a lot of things like, uh, like how long it takes to do these projects, and also um, the difficulty of achieving achieving success in some of these projects. Um, so I would say in terms of compensatory uh, mitigation and particularly out of kind, so in that project, the requirement was to restore a wetland, which ended up being the San Diego wetlands, um, as compensation for 
fish larval losses. And so um, that was my first introduction to a problem that still is a huge problem, and that is how do you equate fish larvae to acres of wetland or whatever? And, um, and so really that's, you know, fundamentally that has cut through a lot of the work that I've done and, um, and is one of the motivations for having this workshop is because we still don't know how to do that and we're trying, you know, there's, there, we have actually made progress in some approaches, but it's still a really thorny problem. And so um, that was my, one of my early introductions to mitigation. We haven't resolved it yet, but maybe we'll resolve it before I die. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. I think that's yeah. There's other there's other issues with how to find mitigation, but that's good enough. Before we go to the next person, is that is that a little bit better? Is the audio a little bit better, you guys? I I switched the input mic. It's way better. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Great. Uh, number next. As I adjust this setting here. Hey, Sean, I can go next because it'll follow on from Rick. Yeah, is that all right? Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Yep. Uh, I'm Pete Ramondi. I'm a professor, not quite yet retired, up at UC Santa Cruz. Pete, Pete, turn your camera on so we can see your, your uh, beautiful visage. Okay. So here I am. Um, um, and I have been similarly working on uh, mitigation for a long time. I got into it slight, in a slightly different way than Rich did, but although we've worked on many of the same projects. And that is I initially got involved by doing assessments of impact. And uh, the assessments were for power plants, desal plants, and oil spills primarily. And to develop the, the models in lots of cases by which we do this, including one that we use for assessment of larval entrainment, which is called the ETM APF model that's routinely used here. And then because of that, because we turn impacts into acres typically, then I've been involved with respect to designing and then implementing mitigation projects that are supposed to be compensatory. And those include songs like Rich has done, and we're still working with it on this, Poseidon, which are all the desal plants, and a lot of uh, restoration mitigation for oil spills, including a current Black Abalone restoration project that was directly related to the refugial oil spill. To me, the, the key issue, um, and Rich talked about a little bit, is these things are oftentimes hoped to be, and actually in a regulatory sense, required to be compensatory. And yet I think that the monitoring for most of these things is insufficient to find out whether there's actually been full compensation for the impact. And so to me, that is the critical uh, concern is that there is some way to evaluate restorations and mitigations um, so that you can compare them to the intended benefit from, from them. And that's enough for me. Cool. Um, why don't we just do, since we're online now, why don't we just, uh, Josh maybe can go next. Sure. This is uh, Josh Collins. I'm Emeritus Chief Scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute, which I helped found. Its primary focus was on large, long-term ecological planning through both regulatory management agencies for the greater Golden Gate ecosystem. I've shifted from the coast inland to the sagebrush sea where I'm focusing on the greater sage grouse and uh, antelope. So I'm off the coast now, <laughs> but no matter where I've worked, um, the biggest challenge has been to, as people have already said, enough accountability to know whether mitigation works or not. And in most cases, it does not work. And then trying to align mitigation under the Endangered Species Act with mitigation under the Clean Water Act. Um, those two things are almost immiscible. And I'll stop there. Cool. Uh, how about Katie? Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Nichols. I work for the State Coastal Conservancy. I'm based in the Bay Area, but my projects are all uh, in SoCal. I work a lot on the Southern California Wetlands Recovery Project for the Conservancy. I think I got involved through this um, because I was on the CSU Coast panel and I think this project is really interesting. Um, I hope that you can connect to a lot of the regulatory agencies and I hope I can maybe help with that. Um, have a couple projects looking at monitoring with some of the folks in the room and um, 
also some of our funding sources come, I currently have a project happening in the Huntington Beach wetlands that's using once through cooling funds. And so we sometimes have some funding sources that we use for projects. So that's kind of where my interest is. Cool. Um, I can't see who else is online. Somebody else is on, uh, is it? Oh, Mike, Mike, are you still here? Yeah, morning, everybody. I'm here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah, Mike Escrow with the Ocean Protection Council. Um, I am a senior scientist there. I lead our biodiversity team. So that's all our work on marine protected areas, um, fisheries and aquaculture, habitat protection and restoration, 30 by 30. I'm our tribal liaison as well. So I lead up our, um, our tribal engagement. And uh, yeah, yeah, my background is in marine ecology, uh, marine protected area monitoring and management. I kind of came to restoration more through my work at OPC, so more on the policy and management side, um, really focused a lot on kelp restoration initially, but now starting to broaden a bit, especially as OPC is developing a um, comprehensive restoration and mitigation policy for the state, which is something that, you know, is, has been a need for a long time to kind of provide more of a um, consistent, you know, statewide approach for how we evaluate, approve, um, and, and even proactively sort of go after and design restoration and mitigation projects. So Sean's prompt was to think about some things in terms of mitigation that pissed me off. Um, so <laughs> I, but I've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go too, too much into detail on, on things that um, kind of grind my gears on mitigation and restoration. But I think the overall issue that we are trying to deal with is that we do need some you know, kind of guidance for, you know, in terms of specifically what's relevant to this group for that offsite and out of kind mitigation, right? It's much harder to think about offsite and out of kind than it is to think about onsite in kind or where you have like established mitigation ratios. And then an even bigger question is how do you start to mitigate for some of those much larger scale impacts, um, which I know is of interest to this group, right? So, moving away from like sort of a, a one particular project that needs to be mitigated for and more like big, you know, changing ocean conditions, um, trends and patterns, big projects like offshore wind and desal. So that's definitely of interest to us. I really appreciate Sean, you looping me in on this meeting. I'm going to stay for as long as I can um, and definitely want to continue to be engaged in this group because I think there's a lot of um, very cool outcomes that can directly inform that policy we're drafting. So yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Charles. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. So um, thanks for the invite, Sean. I'm uh, Charles Lester. I'm at UCSB now. Uh, most of you probably know I spent about 20 years at the Coastal Commission uh, mitigating development impacts. So I'm interested and have thought a lot about mitigation over the years, and I'll uh, stay on today as long as I can. I'm uh, working on some other projects that have to get out, but I appreciate uh, the conversation and and um, you know it's been an active one for a lot of years. So looking forward to seeing what this group can uh, produce to address these issues. Awesome. Uh, is that anybody? Is there anybody? I can't quite see. Is anybody else? I think that's everybody online. Did I miss anybody? Okay, cool. All right, great. Um, uh, we want to get, Spencer, you want to go from the back forward, maybe? Come on. Yeah, please. So I'm uh, Spencer McNeil. I work for the Army Corps of Engineers in the regulatory division. I'm a deputy chief. So we've got about 50 people and we handle Southern California and Central California, Inyo Mono, <coughs> Kern, the Southern portion of San Luis and Arizona. So we have inland systems and coastal. <laughs> um, I've known Rich obviously for a very long time. I was a part of the environmental science and engineering program. And as John said, he and I worked um, shoveling shit um, literally yeah, at, at the old sewage pond area um, on Naval Base Ventura County, Point Magoo, and that was a fun time, a very enlightening time, um, <laughs> and it was just, it was cool because I came from a laboratory setting in microbiology and I got tired of being a bench jockey and I got a chance to be outside doing experiments, and so we were trying to figure out, you know, what were the effects of sewage sludge on these plants. 
before we engaged in large scale restoration. So that was pretty cool. Did that uh, with the core for a while, then I went out to consulting and got involved in some restoration projects. I worked with Rich on the Ormond Beach restoration project, and sadly, all these years later, it's still not in the ground. <laughs> so, um, but it's what we found, and I'm sure all of us, is that this is very challenging. And with regard to whether you're compensating for functional loss, we're not. I mean, I, <laughs> so <laughs> for my dissertation, I looked at a watershed in Orange County in the Elisa Creek watershed. It's about 36 square miles, and I was using a, a functional assessment method. And granted, we're looking at indicators, so we're not measuring actual function. But what I found is that roughly half of the capacity of the streams in that watershed to produce function, half the capacity was gone. And we couldn't look at our database that we used to track impacts and mitigation. It's like, if we looked at that, it looked like the watershed was okay. But I can tell you, having walked all the streams in that watershed, the capacity to perform functions is lost. And particularly as you work towards the coast, because everybody wants to build in Southern California along the coast. That watershed is hammered. And so it was a, I think it was a stark lesson for me that we can aspire to restore functions and provide services. And you know, the terms have been changing, um, but we're not ever going to get there um, fully. And it might be half, it might only be a third. It just depends on what you're doing. But it is important, you know, one of the other challenges we dealt with is, again, on a big scale, I was handling Port of Los Angeles projects for a while, and I don't know if National Marine Fishery Service is involved in this at all, but it'd be good to get their perspective here. They would always say, if we're going to have open water impacts, we want open water mitigation. And we would say, well, you know, there's a lot of benefit to coastal wetlands. So, like, what's wrong with that? I mean, I realize it's out of context. But let's think about things from an ecosystem perspective. And they didn't even want to entertain that. And so this sort of workshop, we've got an opportunity to look at some of these trade-offs. And yes, the trade-offs. <clears throat> if we get the right people involved and really think through this, I think we can find a way to be more flexible. And if you look at our 2008 mitigation goal, there's a lot of flexibility in that goal. So that's how the core is approaching things like compensatory mitigation. So, I'll leave it there. I mean, there's a lot of challenges here, but this group, I think it's an exciting opportunity uh, to, to look at some difficult problems. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. I think I can talk loud enough. Can you guys hear me online? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Good morning, everybody. I think I know most of everybody um, online and at least have talked to or seen your faces on many teams meetings. I am Becky Yoda. I am with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I am going on my 32nd year with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. <laughs> and hopefully staring retirement down the throat here pretty soon. We'll see how that goes. If I can have enough time to put the paperwork in, it might work. <laughs> um, so, Half or more of my time with the department, well, all of my time has been with the marine region within the department. Um, uh, more than half of it has been in environmental review and conservation. Now, you know, I, I did start out as a scientific aide working on chrome cod. Um, I did abalone work. I've done, I've managed herring fisheries, worked on rockfish. I mean, pretty much everything that's out there for us to do, I've, I've touched it in some way. <clears throat> Sometimes not great, but you know, <laughs> it worked out. So, um, but then moved over into the conservation and the environmental review of water quality. Um, so I have been a, an environmental program manager for, I was trying to think of it last night, probably close on, close to 15 years now or a little bit more, it's been a while. Um, and my program deals with, manages the marine protected areas for the department's management role um, and then also we have environmental review and water quality, as I said, and that project touches pretty much anything and everything that could impact the marine and natural environment. So we deal with CEQA, CESA, uh, dredging, dredging projects, <laughs> artificial reef, I'd like to talk to all of you, um, and, and offshore wind is under my program, aquaculture, ocean aquaculture is under my program, 
Um, decommissioning is under my program, so you get the idea. So I'm extremely excited about this group because we have been dealing with this as long as I can remember of how to do this in the way that is going to be adequate, whatever that means. We may not get there, clearly, but um, how do we do that? And, and we actually asked uh, the, the Ocean Protection Council in line with Fish and Game Commission a few years ago to help us with a mitigation restoration policy for a consistent approach, particularly on MPAs, but it really applies to everything out there to the best of our ability. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll stop with saying one of my biggest oh my god moments <laughs> was how what are we going to do about this was a very large hydroacoustic survey that was supposed to be going on at Diablo Canyon way back when when they were concerned about Atlas tsunami in Japan they were really wanting to get a better sense of what these what these um, fault lines were like so there was this ginormous hydroacoustic survey that was going to happen most of Michelle will remember this um, that was going to impact a huge number of species given what they were going to do, including cow comment. So I'm like, and close to the mission, we're coming to us and saying, what do we do with mitigate? What are we, how are we going to mitigate? I'm like, I can't make more chemicals. I can't, I can't grow cow cod in a hatchery. What are we going to do that is really going to be that value exchange? helping all of the things that all of you all and you guys have said and and totally i was hoping to go before um my guest because he always feels my thunder but i'm totally in <laughs> step with, totally in step with mike we work with opc all the time and all the permanent agencies so it's pretty much the same thing and we really really need help in that guidance on what to do and i think the consistency is is a big piece and then also and i've heard it a little bit education <laughs> for those who even want to do restoration projects, whether it's a citizen scientist group or a bigger group, help restoration comes to mind, you know, the urchin barren issues, you know, let's let's look to see what makes sense. So I'm really looking forward to this. I hope I can be helpful. Um, so that's that's me. Awesome. Uh, I'm Eric Stein. Uh, I think I know pretty much everybody here. Um, and so I'm really happy to be here, see a lot of my friends from a long time. Uh, I've been working in this arena probably since I was Rich's grad student starting in 1990, so eons ago, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lifetimes ago. <laughs> um, I'm currently with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project Support. I've been there for almost 22 years. Now I head up the biology department, so I've been working on a variety of these issues over the years. Uh, probably most recently, Christine and I are collaborating um, with the Ocean Protection Council on statewide estuary monitoring and causing you know damage and destruction up and down the coast. As, <laughs> as we try to where we start, right? So um, uh, a lot of these issues. Um, I've been working the last few years. I've been doing a lot of work um, at the national level with EPA and the core at the headquarters level. Um, on a variety of things, nature-based solutions, beneficial use of sediment. I've worked with EPA on a national guidance document on how to how states can evaluate compensatory mitigation at the state scale. I've worked with EPA on uh, developing a type conversion assessment framework on how to think about um, type conversion in the coastal zone as it relates to sea level rise and other climate change impacts. So, um, so definitely a lot of these issues are sort of near and dear to my heart. I would say, um, in terms of the sort of my pain points, which are many, um, <laughs> but I think the, the two that I've been thinking about, you know, uh, most recently, and a lot of people touch on this, is kind of this long term impact. And Rich and I were talking before this, we're going back and looking at some of these like 30 plus year old mitigation sites and yeah. really just kind of that long term perspective, and particularly in the context of resiliency and as we're dealing with changing climatic conditions particularly the coastal zone, how we think about you know, these systems and how they're going to be resilient over the long term under these really dramatically changing conditions from sea level rise to acidification to all sedimentation, all things we're dealing with. So I think that's a, a real pain point for me. And then the other one, um, the last few years, I've actually been getting a lot deeper into kind of the ecosystem services arena and done a lot of work on that. And, and just thinking also about, you know, um, particularly in the context of things like mitigation banking and, and 
and sort of shifting ecosystem services where you're like, you know, replacing services in a totally different area than where the impacts have occurred and, and what are sort of the kind of environmental justice and social issues associated with that aspect of, which, you know, historically I thought more on the ecological side, but I've been doing a lot of work recently on more of the, the you know, that side of things and a whole other set of issues that we have to think about, right? So, so yeah, the, 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 there are lots of issues, you know, and they, they run deep, right? <laughs> so, so. Cool. Good morning, everybody. Russell Gallifa, probably the uh, least experienced as a scientist here, but as a manager, <laughs> 40 years retired with the National Park Service. Last gig was the Channel Islands when we did most of the restoration work out there. Uh, so I have been the recipient of uh, mitigations, and mainly a lot of it is in restitution type money to do things. Uh, but on the other hand, I've also been the victim because we've done projects where I've had to do mitigation measures. Uh, and uh, that always uh, upsets um, managers because we never built that part in our budget, typically. <laughs> uh, so uh, on a side, um, I'm working with the IUCN on the Eagle team to list the MPAs in California, potentially for the, blue, the green list, which I'm sure you've all heard of the red list. This is the green list. This is to show you're doing a good thing. And we're just about done, uh, hopefully. Uh, I also am now serving on the Squid Fishery Advisory Committee. Um, and, uh, so I'll be interested in talking to you all, too, because I think there are some mitigation things we should be doing with squid, but it's a very touchy place. Uh, it's a difficult situation. Uh, I also uh, am a lecturer at Cal State University of Channel Islands, mainly in Latin land use, and uh, developed a course many years ago called the National Parks, so which I expose students to what the National Parks are, sort of the whole idea behind it. Uh, and then I serve on the board for the Ventura Land Trust, and I think that that's important I mention that because one of the first things I, I did when Sean said, hey, I would like to be part of this group, is I went right away to the mitigation bank to see, you know, wouldn't that be helpful if we as a land trust knew if there was a mitigation bank in Ventura County? And I found out there are very few mitigation banks throughout the state. And, and how does somebody like a land trust who's really trying to set aside important parcels of a county, um, how can we better set priorities if we knew there was a bank? We could, you know, help toward building that, toward that bank or building around that bank. Uh, I uh, am also uh, very interested in this idea that uh, Pete had mentioned is it's one thing to do mitigation, it's one thing to do long-term research and monitoring after a project, but without any kind of an endowment, it's impossible to do. Uh, and coming from a park that had a long-term database and how much of that money was obligated to kill forest monitoring, how hard it is to keep up over time, we really need to think of some way of, of building endowments for some of these projects so that you don't have to worry about agency or local funding all the time. And the last thing I'll mention is that has always bothered me is how do we, uh, why do we continue to allow development to occur in intact systems without knowing the extent of how much of those intact systems we have in the state, hoping that there's some other thing called mitigation that will balance it. And I always would say this, and I'll go back to the, the artificial reef thing is why wouldn't we say it's okay to disturb current functioning reefs? thinking we can rebuild them somewhere else. That's it. So, I guess it's me. Um, so I'm Christine McCraft. I'm a professor at Cal State Long Beach and the director of environmental science and policy, which is a short name for years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm by training a wetland ecologist, um, but end up on the sort of policy side because wetlands are all about policy, it turns out. <laughs> um, I first, my first foray into mitigation was as a uh, part of the IRT on the Colorado Lagoon Mitigation Bank, <laughs> which was trial by fire, um, but really informative, I think, on the mitigation side, because solidly I've been more just on the restoration side, and um, since then paying a lot of attention, a lot better or more informed attention, I would say, to mitigation. Um, most of my projects now are all over the place, but. Eric mentioned, you know, developing monitoring frameworks, um, 
sort of looking at the impacts of sediment augmentation, oil spill work, things like that. Um, lots of things keep me up at night, including my freezer <laughs> being full of samples, but that's not <laughs> relevant here. Um, but I think where maybe, I mean, I definitely hear all the points that people have said when I organize them to answer that question. Mine fall into sort of the timeline aspect of we, when we've been thinking, and it does come back to my freezer, but we've been thinking a lot about when impacts occur, where does the baseline data to say that it was an impact even occur, which is the um, challenge of funding, right? So doing monitoring long enough term that you can answer the questions when they come around, and then continuing that on the time frame that needs to be done to answer mitigation questions. And then funding that too, because I don't think any person funding mitigation would like to hear that you need 30 years of funding to answer the question too. So some um, funding issues, the second one is one that Rich and I have talked about a lot, which I call equivalency. If you don't have any of the species, say native oysters, how do you, how many wetland acres are equal to an oyster acre? And we can't put it anywhere there are oysters because there aren't oysters. So do we never put it anywhere? So those sort of circular questions about specific species restoration or where out of time mitigation fits into that. And again, then lastly, the question is also maybe a time frame one, but like what Eric said, if you think about climate change scales, you're, you might restore for climate change scenarios, but that would make you meet your success criteria later, but it would still be around. So that idea of balancing sort of climate resilience planning with uh, restoration, short term restoration success seems challenging to me. I guess that's me. So, um, Lauren Garcia Garcia, I'm a senior ecologist at the Coastal Commission, where I've been for the last eight plus years or so. My background is primarily in marine systems, but that has expanded tremendously in my time at the commission, where I now find myself working on everything all the way up to ridge lines and fire. Um, <laughs> as well as the offshore, you know, related to aquaculture and everything in between. Um, for us, obviously, we deal with mitigation issues a lot, and there are plenty of challenges that all of you have iterated that I won't, you know, repeat, but share many of these same sentiments. Um, a few things that I would just maybe add to that is that from our regulatory perspective, having a nexus for out of kind is really, really crucial. We can't just, you know, oh, well, this sounds great. We'll go ahead and do this over here. We have to be able to find a nexus with that impact and be able to make that argument in our legal findings. And so that's one of the things that really binds us to what we can or can't do. Um, the other thing I would just maybe flag with a, also a second appreciation for the conversion off um, discussion that was kind of yeah. suggested there where you know we look at conversion as well and we have to think about what are we losing when we do that yeah. and is that a sensitive resource yeah. and sure this sounds great but that doesn't mean that this other thing doesn't have value that's also important so we have to wrestle with that a lot in our decision making but our team has over the past several years started really kind of looking back and saying, you know, what has the commission done in the past? Is it working? How might that evolve? And so we're kind of in the process of, of going through all of that. We've had a number of graduate students that have kind of taken on projects with us um, to, to start that process. And we've been trying to kind of expand the way that we're thinking about things into more of a framework kind of perspective. Um, and then I guess the other piece is just to really appreciate that that you know there are things that are restoration there are things that are compensatory mitigation we treat those things differently but we recognize the value of both um, and when we talk about you know restoration or mitigation at this point we're trying not to look at it just strictly in that historic lens but always with that forward looking what is this going to evolve into and what's the timeline um, and then in terms of you know things like monitoring, yes, that's really hard. We can't typically go and say, hey, this you know single family home needs to have impacts needs to go monitor for the next 30 years. That's not realistic. And so we have to be in that realm of what can we reasonably achieve in that time frame? And maybe there are multiple avenues to get to that, 
We're certainly starting to look more into advanced mitigation and mitigation banking. We're working on a number of banks presently within the coastal zone. Um, a lot of that is kind of coming together with, um, you know, Caltrans interest in particular. Um, and, and the monitoring aspects is, you know, maybe we aren't going to be able to monitor till we're determined we have equivalency, but we can reasonably require monitoring for a certain amount of time. And are we on the right trajectory? Is it going where we want it to go? Can we trust that? The endowment piece, absolutely. Huge, huge piece of the equation, but it doesn't work for every situation. So just to emphasize that we're dealing with, you know, the really small things to the really big things is everything in between. Cool. Cool. Last. Um, my name is Brenton Spees. I'm uh, a part of the lecturing faculty with, with Sean at, at Cal State Channel Islands in the ESRM department. I'm also the, the research and conservation curator at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium with the city of Los Angeles. Um, I first started in mitigation work um, early in grad school with, with Mark Steele, working on the science mitigation project on the artificial reef, mostly on the fish mitigation side. Um, I still help him out in, in his grad students. It mostly means I, I get to go fishing every summer and just catch fish for the grad students to work up. Um, but I've still been pretty in, heavily involved with, with that whole project, and, and it's, it's an it's a awesome project um, to be a part of. Um, I got into restoration work. Most of my work um, has been focused on the endangered tidewater goby, the northern and the southern tidewater goby. Um, I, was, uh, I worked closely with U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, uh, most of my, my PhD was, was um, funded by U.S. Fish and Wildlife to kind of create these predictive models um, for the recovery efforts. What we found out was that there really wasn't enough data available, presence absence data, to actually do those predictive models. So I spent um, three years going up and down the coast surveying um, close to over 200 estuaries every single year. So I've, I've had nets in almost every single system in, in California. Um, and so because of that, and because there's very few of us in the state that have permits to do tidewater goby surveys, um, I, I've been on a lot of advisory um, committees and, and advising restoration projects whenever there's tidewater gobies available um, or present in the systems. That's kind of led to a lot of other endangered um, and threatened listed species recovery because in those systems there's red-legged frogs, from pond turtles, California newts, um, an armored three spines pickleback, so they're steelhead. So um, a lot of my work is still focused on the endangered species um, side of things. Um, I could bring on part of the, the White Owl and Captive Breeding Program now too, so I'm doing more coastal work. Um, so that's kind of my interest in it. Um, and I think one of the, the things that that hasn't been said yet that, that's uh, concerning to me with mitigation projects is is how to mitigate for those habitats that have endangered or listed species. Because um, I've already found that it's really difficult to even just move a species off site, even if it's similar habitat, right? It's designated as like suitable habitat for these species. Most of those sites don't just have like one species, like say tidewater goby, you're talking loose bulgaria, you're talking, you know, sometimes dozens of, of listed species. And so how do you mitigate for that? And um, especially when it comes to off or, or out of science mitigation. So, yeah. That's it. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, uh, Max Gomez, one of my students, just showed up. Um, so he, uh, uh, he'll be one of our assistants, which we'll talk about uh, as we get into the logistics of the projects. But um, Max is everybody. You just sorry, but you just missed everybody's introduction, but that's okay. You can you can say hi. Um, so awesome. Um, so thanks everybody. So so that I think we all uh, now have a sense of. Uh, I think we have a nice mix of folks, a nice mix of background, experience, uh, uh, struggles, and victories, and all that wonderful stuff. <laughs> um, we're going to pivot now and talk about introduce you guys to the project and that kind of good stuff. So I'm going to um, take a, a quick uh, two minute pause. If anybody wants to hit the bathroom, we get another thing of, of coffee. And then um, uh, I will uh, turn on the slides and share the slides with everybody online. And so give me about two minutes. Did you have Monday to Malibu, whatever Lizzie was doing? I didn't do that, so we know, but we've been.